I would love to go back to see my childhood home in Iran. I would love to go to that beautiful orchard where the family used to gather. I would love to see the country that is, you know, so much a part of my soul, but I'm afraid that if I go back as an adult, I will see the world very differently. I'm sure they would love to have me back, and I would be greeted in the torture chambers of the Islamic Republic of Iran. a member of the International Court of Arbitration and a former United Nations prosecutor at The Hague. He has served with the UN in conflict zones around the world, including Bosnia, Cambodia, Guatemala, Rwanda, and East Timor. Bayer Makaban was born in Tehran. He now makes his home about half the year, he said, in Montreal. The rest of the year, he lives out of a suitcase. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage, Payam Akavan. My own childhood experience of persecution and exile as a member of the Iranian Baha'i minority was the beginning of my human rights odyssey. Mona Mahmoud Najad was no different than any of my friends from Sunday school back in Iran. We were of the same age, in the same community, in the same country. Mona was an outspoken defender of human rights. This in a country where speaking the truth carried grave consequences. Mona's death changed everything. I would never be the same person again. Merci, merci beaucoup. On va à Saint Paul Ouest. For the longest time, uh, my life has been terribly chaotic. My parents live in Toronto. My children are living in England. Sometimes I'm in Montreal. Other times I'm in The Hague or traveling in Africa, South America, Asia. Right now, I'm just happy to finally have this little place here in Montreal. There's plenty of food in my fridge. <laughs> what would you like? <laughs> There's a flight from Heathrow to Montreal. That should have been cancelled. I'm calling about the flight on Friday, Montreal, Toronto, Amsterdam. Too many tickets floating around. Exactly. I'm queued up for refunds. Flight morning call, airman flight 824, Thursday Next stop is The Hague. Mare para Bolivia. We're going to go and fight for Bolivia to have a sea, to have a sea of its own. Because they used to have a sea, and now for 130 years, they've been waiting to be reconnected to the arms of the ocean with which they were born.
four hours of sleep were great. Can we go straight to the hotel? Yeah, no I think so. Okay. There are many nuances to the case. The Chileans are going to argue that they have no obligation towards Bolivia, but Chile was willing to discuss the possibility of reconnecting Bolivia to the sea, but it did so as a matter of diplomacy, so that's really what, what the case is about. So my son was born here in The Hague, my first son. And this is really where I began my career, at the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal when I was in my 20s. Lots of memories. Good and bad. Beginning in 1879, Bolivia became landlocked because of Chile's invasion of its Pacific coast. For 130 years, Chile repeatedly promised to find a solution so Bolivia could retain some form of sovereign access to the sea. Now you can't flood the judges with thousands of facts. You need to, in a half hour, give them a story. You address the president, you address the different judges, so you have to sort of move your head back and forth, not too much, but just enough. And at some point you may want to look at a particular judge, <laughs> depending on what point you're making. Bolivia's case is remarkable in its simplicity. Beginning in 1879, Bolivia became landlocked because of Chile's invasion of its Pacific coast. This case is not an academic exercise. The people of Bolivia have suffered real and continuing injury. Chile cannot sweep this dispute under the carpet. It will remain a constant source of conflict until it is resolved. It's remarkable that today, the vast majority of nations don't go to war to settle their differences. Because for much of history, you went to war when you couldn't get what you want through negotiation. And it's quite remarkable that Bolivia and Chile today are going to settle their difference before the world court. That's a sign of progress, but it's progress that has been very painfully achieved. I like to remember the brutality of history. 
You know, in the 19th century, there were the Napoleonic Wars, which were catastrophic. People were realizing that we just can't continue to resolve disputes through war. And in 1899, there was a peace conference at The Hague where they set up the permanent court of arbitration. People were waking up to a vision in which international law and justice would prevail. Today, we have the idea of human rights, and we can't take for granted that extermination and enslavement of the weak by the powerful is no longer acceptable. That in itself is a huge moral triumph, but it's not enough. In the 1990s, the Yugoslav war broke out. So I witnessed all of these horrors where I began my career with the UN. The Bosnian peace process appears to be going nowhere. Shelling yesterday killed at least eight people, according to Bosnia. We witnessed scenes of ethnic cleansing. The stories were emerging of the systematic use of rape as a weapon of war. So really, these were scenes from hell. The numbers are staggering. 8,000 or so Muslim men and boys slaughtered just because they were Muslim. <laughs> the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia is now in session. Please be seated. Dražen Erdomović um, was what I would call a victim perpetrator. He was forced under duress to massacre 1,200 people at one of the sites uh, surrounding uh, Srebrenica. By way of introduction, I simply want to emphasize that the only way that this court can resolve this question is by looking at the international law, and that clearly indicates that duress cannot be admitted as a full defense to the crime of murder. So Dražen Erdemovic ended up being a key witness, and he confessed to his crimes and agreed to testify against Mladic, and that General Mladic was the commander in charge of the mass execution of some 8,000 uh, Bosnian Muslim boys. Mr. Mladic, sit. Mr. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Mladic, if you, if you continued like this... Uh, and it took, indeed, 16 years from the time that we issued the indictment uh, until his arrest. Adjourn. We adjourn. So I think this is a very important precedent for uh, international criminal justice. And we have to remember that prior to the establishment of the UN War Crimes Tribunal for Yugoslavia in 1993, there was a complete culture of impunity. Not one person uh, was ever prosecuted for genocide from the time of the Nuremberg judgment in 1946 throughout the UN era. So I think that uh, there is cause for celebration today as we see the butcher of Bosnia sentenced to life in prison. But at the same time, it reminds me that it can never really compensate for the suffering of, of so many uh, during the Bosnian war. This beautiful willow is my old friend. And um, during my uh, adolescence, I used to live just down there beyond those trees. And it was a very difficult time for my family, for us. We felt like um, our world was encircled with gloom. Uh, with all the terrible news that we heard from Iran and the destruction of that world of uh, innocence. We would dream not knowing that soon a storm would rip our roots away. 
from the land of our ancestors. As an immigrant adolescent in Canada, one of two brown kids in the schoolyard, I was trying to fit in, I was trying to be cool, I wanted to be popular with my friends. And then I hear about Mona, 16-year-old girl from the Baha'i community to which I belong. She wrote an essay, a high school essay, calling for her human rights. Freedom, Mona wrote, is the most brilliant word. So why don't you let me be free to say who I am and what I want? days, the Baha'is were always vulnerable. We always knew that we were the scapegoats, that if there was political turmoil, we would be the first victims. judge had given the Baha'is a stark choice, Islam or execution. It was an ultimatum to convert or face death. How incredibly powerful she was, that they couldn't break her after months of torture. She went to her death, smiling at her executioner. And I don't think it's because she had lost her mind. To the contrary, I think she knew that she was going to draw her last breath. You can kill me, but you cannot extinguish my humanity. And that always stayed with me. What would I do if I was given a choice between surrendering to tyranny or surrendering my life? What an, what an, an impossible choice. What an impossible choice to be given at the prime of your life. That was a turning point. Either I'm gonna turn my back to this injustice or I'm going to rise to the occasion. And I decided to become a fighter, to struggle for justice um, because it was my only path of redemption. populated country in the world and we're about to go to the biggest refugee camp in the world 
There's a difference between people's daily struggles, trying to make ends meet, and those who've been stripped of their humanity and um, sent to the refugee camps to die a slow death. There's a very big difference. Photos. Um, yes, yes. Uh, last year, when in September, when the the part quantity of uh, Rohingya people coming to Bangladesh. This so is, September um, 2017. September 2017 is uh, nearly the border side. Just now, they just crossed the border. And I understand that uh, uh, the vast majority have crossed into Cox's Bazar yes. district. Yes. Yeah. Are they crossing a river here? Is yeah, this the? Is here this is the, the river. Yes. So there's a river even northeast of Naf. Yes. Yeah. Uh, after cross the Myanmar Bangladesh border, then they also need to walk more than five kilometers to get to the camp. Right. Uh, I asked the lady. Uh, she said uh, uh, it needs 15 days to come Bangladesh, and on the way, my baby. Mm. So she gives this, birth on on the way. Yeah, on the way. This, uh, this children's name is Asnitara. She lost her parents. He's been shot in the head. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. We just want to add one. We just want to add one paragraph, which addresses um, a, new, a new issue, which came to us last night. Um, but then it, we could go to Cox's Bazaar earlier. But we can we can talk about that. So we'll see you after the meeting with the Prime Minister. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the office. For the office. I first met the Prime Minister about 10 years ago when I came to Dhaka and she won with 87% of the votes. And the country has seen a period of unprecedented stability and prosperity. Thank you. 
no description at this point, though it is not related to the company we discussed. Yes, I'm at your service, so thank you for the office. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Thank so there's a new nice. book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My father's new book. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you very very It's remarkable to be here. It's such a beautiful, beautiful sea and people come here for vacation. This is the uh, leading resort in Bangladesh. People come here with their families to have a wonderful escape from the smog and awful noise of Dhaka, the traffic. Um, but just a short distance away from here, we have a sea of misery. We have uh, more than a million refugees who have lost everything. They've been stripped of their homes, they've been stripped of their dignity. Um, and it's this um, perplexing contrast um, between the beauty of this place uh, and the horrors just, just behind those hills. I'm the commanding officer of Border Guard Bangladesh here. I do operate in this area. Welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thank you. You know, we are just very near to the Bangladesh Myanmar border. This is a Rohingya refugee camp. Uh -huh. It's in the no man's land. You can see those barbed wire fence coming down yes. from the hill. Those are very much inside Myanmar. Uh -huh. Suddenly, I heard huge gunshot across the border. It's a massive volume of fire. Lots of civilians, including women and children, they were running, rushing towards Bangladeshi border as firing was going on at their back. And it is something you need to see really how the civilian negotiate barbed wire fence when firing is going on at their back. That's really something to be seen. Mm -hmm. At that point of time, it was not known to me that such a massive influx is on the way. I was instructed by the highest authority of my country that no matter what's happening there, you consider the humanitarian aspect, keep it on the top because these are the people, they are the victims of mass atrocities. Mm -hmm. Also, I, I also understood, I said, that when I have seen the innocent civilians are crossing, usually the border fence coming towards my country, I thought that these people are victims. They are not a threat to us, so doesn't matter I put on uniform, but I'm a human being. I have to protect the humanity. The locals were taking the refugees uh, and helping them? Local, what they are doing, I not say taking, because what they will take? but they had been helping them, providing water, necessary food, talking nice to them, at least some good words, so that tomatoes people feel good. Mm -hmm. or whatever they could, whatever they could. That's what they did. Well, I can tell you that your people are far more generous than the people in my part of the world who are always complaining oh, I, I about immigrants and refugees, and you have a million people here, and these people that don't have that much to share, are still sharing it. So it's a, it's a role model yes, for all I of us. I can tell you one thing, sir. I believe they are human beings. Hardly matters. They're from which country, which nation. Right from this Rohingya camp, 
I have seen the standing on my, on my own eyes. It was difficult for me to. They told horrible dead bodies. As they chased them down, they came up to the barbed wire fence. They didn't cross it. They, chased, they, they were chasing the Rohingya. Yeah, as I said, they had been firing on the back their back. Are some of these photos taken by the refugees few, themselves? Few. What do they have? Tele telephones? Like they cell phones phone? yeah, yeah. to research, analyze, and do all This is a mass grave. We have reports of um, Myanmar military using loudspeakers to tell people to leave. Right here. Yes, yes, right, here. right here. Right here. And do you it have was any, happening in this morning. Do you have, film, came down. Do you have okay. film, films of that? Yes, we have. So this morning, yeah. this morning they were telling the people to leave. Yeah. Which people? The people in no man's land. People in no man's land. And are you now in the no man's yeah. land? Yeah, yeah, no man's land. You're in that area yeah, yeah. there? On the Myanmar side or on the... Myanmar side. Myanmar side. Yeah. Were they shooting uh, uh, indiscriminately or were they targeting people? Targeting the people. Targeting the people. When they saw who is they saw the men, they had fire targeting them. They entered my village, military and border guard police and local mob. They fired, they targeting the who see the people. Fire uh, some people that uh, four people, my witness, four people that on the spot, uh, another six people got injury among the injury. One of the my elder son, what do you Another couple, hot tank. I was sure I cannot leave the another table. I was in low education. Everything, everything lost. My name is uh, Payam uh, Akhavan. I'm from Canada. I'm a, a professor of international law and I used to be prosecutor with the United Nations. I'm of Iranian origin, so I can say Alaikum Salam to all of you. It is useful for us to understand the circumstances under which you have come uh, into Bangladesh. Uh, so we are here to listen uh, and we thank you to share your stories as, as you wish. Thank you. In front of him, four of his uh, actually relatives killed by the man. Thank you. Thank you. মেরেটি <laughs> In his family, 12 died. Beshumar, you are going to be like that. What are you going to do? You are going to kill him. You are going to
there are some basic humanitarian needs that they have here, uh, but they're also severely traumatized. They need um, therapeutic treatment as well. Um, and even if we look at the idea of the International Criminal Court bringing a, a case against you know, a handful of the top leaders, I think that there is a wider need for a catharsis, uh, for healing. Just the act of telling your story, it's a way for them to reclaim their humanity. One, your child was killed by the way. So when she's praying and his uh, younger brother moved to her, then she's uh, shot. Uh, so they hide in the jungle of the hill four days. There is no food, there is no... Uh, and another five days they have to need to reach our border. The, all, of, all the village is burned. There is no trees, no belongings, on the ashes. That you are the now you are the guardian of us. So she want justice to you. At a time like this, I, I, I think about Mona. I think about Mona who started me on this journey. Um, and I know that she would want me to be here right now. She would want me to be here with, with these people to at least hear their stories, to at least let them know that they matter.
been here for more than a decade. It's really strange coming from the arena to the academy. And you realize that it's really important to have both action and reflection. So here I try in my teaching and scholarship to bridge the gap between what happens out there and how we process it in the academy. Treat the cat well. Don't treat the cat like you treat me. Just saying. Just saying. Bye. <laughs> Very often you have a massive crime, and we know from our class, crimes against humanity is you know, widespread, systematic. We're not dealing with an isolated atrocity. And the International Criminal Court isn't really going after the foot soldiers. It wants to go after those most responsible. So they're the leaders, the political leaders, the military commanders, who are typically not at the scene of the crime. They're the ones that order and instigate and create the system which allows for massive victimization. So the evidence isn't just about what we call the crime base, villages that were burned, people that were killed, incidents of rape and torture and all of these horrible things, but you need to link the perpetrator, the accused, to the crime. So we have what's called command and control evidence. So easier said than done, the evidence that you keep in your back pocket and you just hope that the other side will walk into the trap. So you can just sort of, you know, have that aha moment. You know, it's great to want to change the world in the classroom. That's what I tell my own students today. But when you go out there and you're wounded and you pay a price for your ideals, that's when idealism matters and we need to fight, and part of that fight is holding on to hope against impossible odds. Well, if we have the chance to talk, it's wonderful, but as long as he's here, we are so happy. When he is here, the difference is that even we cannot talk to each other. <laughs> because we have to be quiet. Always is busy interview or not true. Not true. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is ow, ow. This is called tadik. It's a potato they put at the bottom of the rice cooker, and it is to die for. So I come here and they spoil me, and then I get ready to go out there and eat airplane food and all the other garbage. <laughs> That picture was three and my other son was six. So he was very quiet, but Payam, I cannot tell. <laughs> Even <laughs> when they were taking a picture, was moving and, you know, struggling, yes. <laughs> wrestling. <laughs> so, I saw the photographer, <laughs> sir, he said, he shot, sit out. <laughs> 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 It's my fault, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're like supposed to be bookends. <laughs> We've been through a lot together. My parents taught me the power of dignity. That's even if you lose 
everything, you always have your character, you always have your beliefs, and that's what matters in the end. And I think that's been the biggest gift they've given me. So. Yeah. You make me to cry. <laughs> <laughs> The most important thing I learned as a child is that the greatest station we can achieve is to be a servant of humanity. Prepare to keep left and then immediately keep left. My beliefs as a Baha'i transform my sense of grief and rage into a force for good. So now the question of justice. Well, we have this thing called the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court only has jurisdiction in relation to states that have accepted it. And Myanmar is not a party to the statute of the court. So what do we do? There's one loophole, if you like. Bangladesh is a member of the court. And whatever occurs on the territory of Bangladesh does fall within the jurisdiction of the court. And among the different types of crimes against humanity, such as murder, torture, uh, rape, one of those acts is deportation. The crime of deportation is completed on the territory of Bangladesh, and therefore the court has jurisdiction. Hi there, I, someone called me. My name is Paya Makalong, yeah? Oh, they're downstairs. Okay, because they were supposed to call Genie. Okay, we'll, we'll go right down. Thank you, bye. One, two, three. One, two, three. Hold on. Easy, easy. Come. Okay, okay. I got the apartment for the piano. I just live here occasionally, so the okay. piano lets me crash here once in a while. So. Perfect. Beautiful. It's like one of my few worldly possessions, and I'm not really attached to material things, but somehow I have a relation with this piano. I don't know. Maybe because it takes me to beautiful places. Wow. It's gonna be really out of tune though. It's gonna be really out of tune. It shouldn't be kept. After it, was five kept years. it was kept stable, it didn't move around. Amazing. You know, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. Yeah. So that's the I need a smaller Allen key. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. I can't believe it after five years. Try it with me. It's amazing, I'm gonna stay here and play forever. chapter of my life. It was where I left the UN, went into academia. There was a lot going on. And I think in Montreal I realized that although I wanted to save the world, that sometimes you also need to just save yourself. 
You need to heal, you need to deal with your own needs, your own sanity, and make sure that uh, in the midst of this, you know, harsh desert, you have an oasis. I miss my family, I miss having some sense of stability. It's difficult and it's painful to live this uh, uprooted life. So I chose the difficult path and I stand by it and I'll pay the price for it and I have. افتخار همگی ماست ضروری است که مردم ایران و جامعه جهانی از بیعدالتی هلناکی که در حق بسیاری از انسانها در ایران اعمال شده و سالها با سکوت همراه بوده آگاه شوند این جنایات از همان اولین روزهای پس از انقلاب آغاز شد که جمهوری تازه به قدرت رسیده تلاش می کرد با از میان برداشتن مخالفین خود از طریق زندانی کردن آنها و اعدامشان چه با تیرباران یا حلق آویز کردنشان پایه های خود را مستحکم کند Could you describe to the court who the young woman is in the photograph? پدرم رو دوست دارم اما می ترسم از اینکه پدرم رو بکشم و, و همینطورم شد We broadcast the testimony of the victims maybe 20 million people in Iran for the first time ever realized that in that first decade of the revolution, tens of thousands of people were executed simply because of their beliefs. And it forced the regime, after almost 30 years of denial, to admit that these crimes had indeed occurred. I think that 
human rights is at the core of any viable long-term solution to the problem of Iran in the Middle East. Coming here to Istanbul with a 90-year-old father, like my mother, may never be able to see his home again. So to be able to bring them as close as possible to their country of origin is very tantalizing. وقتی که خبر این اعدام ها در شیراز پیش اومد و شما شنیدی و خصوص وقتی شنیدی که منا هم سن و سال شما بود شما به کلی به کلی یک آدم دیگه ای شدی فکر کردن به این که حالا چی شما وظیفه شما چی در مقابل این خیلی وقت مشکلی بودش بله خیلی ما خیلی خیلی خوشحال بودیم از اینکه می‌دیدیم که شماها این جور به اصطلاح احساس دارید به اینکه باهایی هستید احساس دارید اینکه وظیفه ای دارید نسبت به این مسائل بی تفاوت نبودید بی تفاوت نمی‌گذارید این برای ما موجب افتخار شد خب باید مبارزه کرد بله I've testified before the human rights committees of both the Senate and the House of Commons and I'm going to try to talk about our visit to Kutupalong camp, where things stand with the International Criminal Court and how Canada could help push that process forwards. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. C'est un très grand honneur de pouvoir partager avec vous aujourd'hui mes expériences concernant la lutte pour la justice pour les Rohingyas. I appreciate that the government of Canada has adopted a resolution recognizing what has happened as genocide, but even more important is the move towards some form of accountability to ensure that those that are committing these crimes appreciate that there is a cost that will be exacted. And I'm pleased to say that following extensive pleadings, the court ruled that it did in fact uh, have jurisdiction in respect of those crimes. Some measure of justice, however inadequate, is essential for the uh, healing uh, of the victims, um, and that itself uh, is a good enough reason, in my view, to support um, proceedings before the uh, International Criminal Court. Let me ask you a question that I have been asked consistently since this crisis has started and see if you can answer it because I couldn't answer it. I was asked constantly, why is the world not paying attention? Why is the world reacting so slowly? Is it because we're Muslim? Is it because we're brown skin? Why?
I'm so happy to see you. Mm -hmm. I was worried you wouldn't come. <laughs> Are you kidding? We're getting younger. We're getting younger. You look wonderful. wonderful. No, no, in the end, I decided I, I couldn't make it. I had no, to come. No, you had to come. Yeah, I Rwanda has taught us so much about what it takes to reckon with a deeply traumatic past. Have we learned anything about our failure to prevent the Rwandan genocide, just as today another genocide is happening in Myanmar? Fortunately, the United Nations established the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which I had the pleasure of assisting. And in 1998, the Akayesu case became the first genocide conviction ever before an international criminal tribunal. And I think that contributed tremendously to allowing Rwanda to, to cleanse itself, if you like, to have a kind of catharsis. Il est auteur, il a écrit survivante, et après la fleur de Stéphanie, Esther Mujawai, qui nous arrive directement d'Allemagne pour nous Quand j'ai vu la salle pleine, aujourd'hui, un 7 avril, je me suis dit, mais c'est beau Montréal. Parce que pour nous qui étions au Rwanda en 94, le 7 avril, c'était pas ça. Le 7 avril, c'était vraiment la peur panique. On ne savait pas où est-ce qu'on va. Tu n'as plus de père, tu n'as plus de mère, tu n'as plus de tante. Tu es une gamine. Tu es une jeune femme, mais tu n'as plus de mari, tu n'as plus de sœur, tu n'as plus de cousine, tu n'as plus beaucoup de mes amis, beaucoup d'autres veuves n'ont plus d'enfants. On avait tué toute la société rwandaise. La société est morte. Pour qu'un génocide soit possible, tu dois tuer les valeurs. Et là, au Rwanda, on a bien, bien massacré les valeurs. Et comme je vous dis, comment tu vas vivre sans avoir confiance en qui que ce soit Je vous ai dit, les femmes ont tué, mais les profs ont tué leurs élèves. Les élèves ont tué leurs professeurs. Des médecins ont tué leurs malades. Ou des... C'était quelque chose que... Comment veux-tu que je fasse encore confiance à qui que ce soit Donnez-moi d'abord le droit de sortir la haine et la colère qui est à moi. Parce que tant que cette colère, tant que cette haine n'est pas verbalisée, n'est pas dite, elle se hait elle-même, elle se déteste elle-même. Même la nature. J'en ai voulu aux fleurs pendant longtemps. Les salopes, elles, elles fleurissaient, elles continuaient. Excusez-moi, j'ai pas Et on a mis du temps. La vie revient. Ce n'est pas complètement fini. C'est encore des exercices, c'est encore à faire. Mais au moins, je suis sûre que les, que les éléments sont là. C'est ça qui fait la, la fierté maintenant. Maintenant, on a planté beaucoup et j'en veux sur le years ago, but we're also celebrating the astonishing resilience of the human spirit. Yeah. <laughs> and those young, beautiful oh, mothers so and girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the next generation is there. Uh, I can get old in peace. <laughs> I'm getting old in peace. Yeah. <laughs> No more genocide in Rwanda. 
no more genocide in the world. There were times in my life when I had hope, other times when I despaired. Where are the leaders? Where are the visionaries? Where are the people with the courage to talk about what needs to be done? this morning to hear the first round of oral observations of Myanmar on the request submitted by the Gambia. Honorable judges, for any genocide to occur, two things must be present. A dehumanization of the other and the indifference of the international community. And it will be irresponsible for any of us to simply look the other way and pretend that it is not our business, because it is our business. I now invite Professor Akavan to take the floor. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, it is a privilege to appear on behalf of the Gambia. On 9 December 1948, in the shadow of the Holocaust, the world said, never again. Yet, in Srebrenica, Rwanda, Darfur, and many other sites of sorrow, we have witnessed again and again humankind's failure to prevent genocide. We appear before you today because there is still time to save the Rohingya. We turn to this court as the guardian of the Genocide Convention to prevent their further destruction at the hands of Myanmar. Some 600,000 Rohingya remain in Myanmar. They are in urgent need of protection. They remain under serious risk of genocide. The International Court of Justice, the world's highest court, has ordered Myanmar's government to prevent its military from committing acts of genocide against the Rohingya. The Rohingya in Myanmar have been subjected to acts which are capable of affecting their right of existence. The ICJ has also warned that the Rohingya Muslim minority remain at serious risk of genocide and ordered the country to abide by the Genocide Convention and take all measures within its power to prevent further killings.
A lot has happened in the past two years. We've taken very important steps forward in achieving some justice. Even if it's not possible to immediately arrest some of these people. Some of those who are in power today may not be in power tomorrow. There are several more stages remaining until the court hears the full case and gives a judgment. Myanmar will be given the opportunity to defend itself, so that's why it takes some time. We have to be uh, patient because we have no choice, but we have to continue demanding justice, and that is your right. It is your right to demand justice. Justice is a, is a long journey, but we are with you all the way to the end. I would grow up understanding that speaking truth to power could be a matter of life and death. That bearing witness, even in the darkest moments, was fundamental to fighting tyranny. Mona wrote, why don't you push aside the thick veil from your eyes? I remembered Mona's last wish, that the youth should arise in service to humanity, that they should move the world. If I go back to Tehran, I'm afraid that I will see the world very differently. I would see the cruelty, the injustice, and it would destroy all my childhood memories. But I feel that one day I will go back. I have a responsibility to fight for justice, and it's a matter of self-respect. It's a matter of looking at myself in the mirror, silence of my own conscience, and saying that at least I tried. I tried in this world of chaos and madness and cruelty and greed and corruption, that I rose to the occasion. That's the most that I can hope for. In the cradle of his fame Where the rivers turn to red The sunlight softens the dark And the shadows in their lives drift apart She knows. 